Hello, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of ComposerCast, the show where we explore the world of video games and the music that brings them to life. Today, I'm joined by my guest, Brennan Vitek, a game designer, developer, and musician based out in Georgia in the States. So, thank you, Brennan, for being my first American guest. Thank you so much for having me on. I'm very, very excited. Yeah, I'm excited about this too. So on this episode, we're going we're gonna to chat about um, and have a look at video game music that sort of reflects narrative. And you've kindly chosen a few tracks for us, and I think I had time to throw in one track myself, <laughs> but hopefully that should be enough. I didn't quite know how this was going to go, so I just kind of like splattered everything against the wall with as much as I could. <laughs> oh yeah, no, I had no idea either. I just thought, yeah, let's hit the record button and see what happens. <laughs> Sounds great. Sounds <laughs> great. I love it. Okay, uh, so if we go on to track number one. So the first track you've picked is a Rundus' theme from Metroid Prime 3, and it's composed by Kenji Yamamoto. Um, yeah, can you tell us a little bit about why you chose it and why you enjoy it? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. On the subject of uh, game music reflecting the narrative, this is always my prime example I like to talk about. Um, so the Metroid series has always carried a major theme throughout every game, and that's isolation. Uh, every adventure that you've ever gone on in a Metroid game is a lonely trek through like hostile alien environments with nothing but yourself and like the occasional AI or deceased hologram to keep you company, right? And even then, that's like rare. Uh, so in Prime Three, Metroid Prime Three, uh, Rundus is a fellow bounty hunter you meet at the intro sequence of the game. He's tough, he's powerful, and like he knows it. He likes to crack jokes and shrug at odds and that kind of thing. Uh, out of all the other characters, he interacts with your character, Samus, the most. Uh, he quickly grows on you as a player. Uh, after having his mind corrupted by Toxin, this song plays as you fight him. Uh, the tune, while loud and fast and intense, it's got drums and choirs and that kind of thing, uh, carries a strikingly melancholy and minimal melody line on top. That's kind of a theme uh, I'll talk about a, a, a couple times. Um, the song... I like to imagine sings of a cocky warrior asking for a noble death deep down from a corrupted evil mind. Like there's still part of him in there, right? Uh, as you listen to the song, all I can ever think about is that you have to fight the only friend you've ever had. Which is so depressing. Yeah. <laughs> so sad. Yeah, it really, really is. But it makes it... Um, it makes it uh, even all the more powerful, all the more of a memorable experience. Yeah, it, it definitely sounds it sounds cool. Um, have you always been a fan of like the Metroid series, or is or was this kind of like the first one you played? Oh yeah, always. Um, I got a brother who's about ten ish years older than I am, uh, and so he yeah. grew up with um, like the N sixty four and the GameCube and PlayStation that kind of thing, and so I grew up watching him. Uh, so where he was playing. A couple of Metroid games, I really loved them, and then I went up, and then I bought my own, and then by that time it was uh, Metroid Prime Two and Prime Three, and that's what I had gotten into. Cool. I have to say, I've only played one of them, and I think I think it was on the very old Game Boy, on the black and white one. <laughs> I, have, I have vague memories of playing it, but I still get that sense of what you were talking about. You're you're like a soul character, and you're just alone and going through space and shooting aliens, and yeah, yeah. I got that yeah. sense just from that one. Okay, well, this is uh, Rundus' theme by Kenji Yamamoto.
Okay, our second track today, it's um, it's the only one that I picked out a uh, little last minute, <laughs> but it's <laughs> it's a fantastic piece. So it's uh, Geralt of Rivia, and it's of course from the game The Witcher 3, and it's composed by, and I'm just going to say his first name for now, and I'll have to figure out the last bit, but it's composed by Marcin Subiwovich. One of those names. Um, so yeah, so... <laughs> Well, this track, <laughs> this track is awesome. It's, um, how would you describe it? It's like a beautiful and flowing to begin with. And I think it really reflects like, the calmer and more composed side of Geralt as a character. So I don't know if you're saying you haven't played The Witcher 3 before? No, I've not. I'm, I'm, I'm excited. Have you played any of The Witcher games? I know, I haven't. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, Geralt's like this, um, I don't know if you come across him at all, but he's this sort of stern character and he's got one sword to kill monsters and one sword to kill anything that's not a monster. So lots of <laughs> humans um, as he goes around murdering everyone. But yeah, he's got like these two sides of him, I feel. He's very, he's very sort of calm and composed until something just sort of switches and then the heads start falling off and um, yeah, blood everywhere. <laughs> So he's got like these two sides to him. Is that what you're saying? That's yeah. That's how I see it. I'm not sure it's really um, like that. I don't think it's really pushed as that in the game. Okay. Uh, but to me, he always seems like yeah. He seems like he's very, he's very logical and calm and relaxed and composed. And then suddenly mm. he'll just be like, oh, monsters appear, and you've jo- you don't just kill the monsters. You don't just kill the humans. Like it does a slow mo kind of camera on lots of this stuff, um, oh, and cool. their heads do fall off and their arms fall <laughs> off, and he just goes mad and he's covered in blood, and then it's back wow. to having a normal conversation <laughs> with one of the NPCs. <laughs> wow, what a man! <laughs> yeah, it's a very cool game. Uh, so as far as this track goes, I think it, yeah, it, I think it also represents like the huge open world that you play in. It gradually it builds up it starts off all nice and relaxed and then it like it builds up with brass and big drums coming in and it totally changes the tone of the track but it does it in like a really smooth way which i'm super impressed with and yeah it becomes this massive action-packed track which you'll hear in a minute so i think that does that kind of dual personality thing i think it shows you the calm relaxed side of him and then bam battle time <laughs> oh, very cool very cool yeah but at the end of the track you hear, I find it, well, I find it interesting. You hear like the last few seconds, it just goes super calm again and all nice and relaxed for about oh, five yeah. seconds before it ends. So I, th- I think to me, that kind of represents that's Geralt's like <clears throat> actual personality. That's what he really is. And I think he's just kind of forced to go and fight all these monsters and stuff. Cool. That's my interpretation anyway. I could be looking far too deep into this. Um, hey, that's what this whole subject is about. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> so this is Geralt of Rivia by Marcin, and I'll leave out the surname for now. <laughs> Enjoy. <laughs>
So before we go on to the next track, like I wanted to ask you, what got you into video games? Uh, so I know you already mentioned you got an older brother. Was that when you started playing, when you were watching him? Yeah, I, I have my brother Alan to thank for honestly a lot of my hobbies and a lot of my interests. Um, I've told the story a bunch of times all over the place, but essentially because of the age gap, right? There was never any sort of uh, sibling rivalry as uh, brothers and sisters get uh it was always just like everything yeah. he did was always the coolest thing ever and i had to be like alan <laughs> i want to be like that uh he got a lot more of the artsy side he would paint and he would draw and that kind of thing and it turned out i got a bit more of the music side so but i remember i'd I, i'd try and draw and get frustrated and whatever um <laughs> but yeah no he would uh he he always played games he had his friends over and played games and it would be a rare treat when he would let me sit on the back of the couch after bedtime and watch him play Final Final Fantasy X, which is where our next song is coming from. Ooh, it is, yeah. So, well, let's move on to the next track then. So, you've picked, or do you want to introduce it? Yes, I'd love to. Uh, so, this is a track that is very, very near and dear to my heart. It's called Hymn of the Faith, uh, F-A-Y-T-H, because it's Final Fantasy, it has to be edgy. Uh, and this <laughs> is from Final Fantasy X. Uh, as I said, a game that uh, my brother really enjoyed. Uh, he played it at a time... Uh, it was 2001 when Final Fantasy X came out. Um, not to date myself, but I was four. <laughs> um, wow, just thinking, how old was I when it came out? I remember, I remember playing. Well, I remember playing Final Fantasy VII when that came out. So number ten, I would have been thirteen or fourteen, I think. Okay. Oh, well. Okay. Cool. Yeah. That's that. That that's about the age gap then. So my brother was thirteen or fourteen. Um, and I was just a tiny little thing. So that was even back before I could really read that mm -hmm. well, right? So what I absorbed as a kid was the, uh, the sounds and the music and that kind of thing. Um, just all yeah. deep in that uh, rose-colored nostalgia. Um, so I had the opportunity to play this game again about two-ish summers ago. A friend of mine let me borrow it. So I'll give my little spiel on why Hymn of the Faith is a really cool song to reflect narrative. Um, so the game takes place in this world called Spira. Um, it is a world torn to shreds by an ever-present evil called Sin. Uh, the, everyone in Spira has lived with like this kind of fear that they don't talk about for a thousand years. Um, Sin comes back every hundred years or so and just like demolishes islands and towns and cities and causes a lot of damage. Uh, each time Sin comes back around, a summoner, kind of like a religious figure, uh, comes back and summons these big monsters to beat back sin and bring another hundred years of calm. So for all this time, a world is tired and weary and doesn't know when sin is going to come back. And this one summoner chosen is like their one beacon of hope. Um, so this song is played in every church you visit as you go across the game. Uh, and it's... It's, it's like a 30 second loop, but the lyrics and the meaning behind it reflect uh, the people's cries for peace, the people's cries for loving the summoner and uh, wanting to help out and that kind of thing. Well, yeah, it's a really nice piece. Um, and it's, it's all choral as well, which fits in with the, the whole church um, right. setting. Right. And, yeah. and obviously it's not in English. Um, I was going <laughs> to ask, do you think, do you think that like the translation of the lyrics, um, do you think that adds to the emotional impact of the song or do you think like it works even if you didn't know what the words mean? Uh, both, I think. Um, from the latter point of view, um, a lot of people that played this game can't speak Japanese, right? So it's still, it still kind of gets the point across just based on, I guess, how it sounds. <laughs> um, yeah. uh, but the lyrics roughly translate to something like save us, summon or bring us peace or something like that. Yeah, it's cool. Um, there's definitely like a lot to choose from, but and it's it's going to be a difficult question. <laughs> what would you say is your favorite Final Fantasy game of the series? Oh, geez. Well, admittedly, I haven't played that many. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's like seventy to choose from, uh, but I, yeah. I honestly do like ten. Uh, one for because of that's I've played the most of. Um, like I've played about half of fifteen. I played a little bit of seven, um, but ten yeah. I've. Uh, basically beat and of course it holds all that nostalgia because that was my brother's game right i grew up watching it play it yeah for me that's final fantasy 7 so that one was like for me as a kid that came out and it had this amazing soundtrack and wow 
yeah, sort of blew my mind as a kid. I wanted to put the Final Fantasy VII uh, fighting theme on here, but there's already enough Final Fantasy. <laughs> this <laughs> is <laughs> Hymn of the Faith by Nobu Uematsu. Okay, so this one um, is another Final Fantasy one. <laughs> I think this one would count as a fan favorite, like across all the series. It's the one that I'd hear everyone saying they love this one. And I went to a video games live show um, before and they played this one and the crowd just erupted. Oh, no way. Yeah, they That's loved cool. it. <laughs> it's such a good one. Um, so you chose One Winged Angel. Yeah, yeah. It is, if you have not heard the song before, first of all, like, what rock have you lived under? Second of all, you're about to, <laughs> so this is going to be great. Um, the reason I picked this song, apart from the fact is that it's awesome, uh, there's actually a cool story behind it. Uh, now, I'm paraphrasing here. This is what I got from the story. This is what I got from looking it up. I'm sure there are things kind of different, right? Um, but basically, it plays during... The la is is he the last boss like Sephiroth's angel form? Is that the very last of Final Fantasy VII? I want to say yes, but I am the worst at completing games, so <laughs> I wouldn't know. <laughs> I've played, you know, I've played okay. Final Fantasy for like well, over my entire lifetime, probably forty, fifty hours, and I just restart it all the time. I, I never get very far. <laughs> I'm awful at finishing games. But now I have it oh, man. sitting on my... Um, have you seen the Retro Pi? No, I haven't. Uh, you know the um, no. you know the Raspberry Pi? The tiny little credit yes. card computer? Um, you can turn them into... <laughs> yeah. You can turn them into a Retro Pi and you basically it just... You have a little SIM card, not SIM card, SD card and you can just preload all the emulators on there. So there's this one little program pops them all on there and then you just go download all the all the roms and you've got anything up to the ps1 and it's amazing oh man we're living in the future we are and it's it's <laughs> so small it's this tiny little black box that just sits under my tv plug in the wired xbox controller and you can play the snes or the ps1 or anything you want so i've got i've got final fantasy 7 sitting on there still i've got to up to the bit where you do the cross dressing at the beginning you have to dress up like a girl <laughs> And go and fight a boss. And yeah, it's really nice though because you can like save it um, at points where you wouldn't normally be able to save in a game. So you can just make little saves. Oh, a uh, save like emulator. state, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Which, which cool. just takes all the pressure off. So I'm going to I'm gonna play it. I'm going to complete it. And I'm going to hear this song in the game. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Good. Good. I'm rooting for you. Um, so, okay. It, it plays during... The, well, one of the later boss fights, if not the final boss, uh, with the big scary white haired dude named Sephiroth. He's like this corporate anarchist who has used uh, technology to kind of steal the life force of the planet to ascend himself as a demigod. It's got this very like uh, ex machina natural versus unnatural theme going on. Um, yeah. So the composer, Nobu Uematsu, uh, knew that to write a song that reflects this like strange and unnatural type feel, uh, he had to compose in a weird way. Um, so as I said, I'm paraphrasing here, but every day for the writing period of the song, he would compose like a couple measures. Like he'd take a new uh, musical idea and just write it down, right? Um, and then after a time, he just kind of slammed them all together. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what came out was that uh, it was a song that while awesome and epic literally makes no sense like you <laughs> get there and for a couple bars your brain is like okay cool i got this and then it just like changes into something completely different right um yeah. and so i i like to think that it reflects the kind of as i said like natural unnatural fighting here about a man ascending through technology oh, yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> cool uh anything else you want to say before we play the track this is a heck and rad song I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is One Winged Angel. Enjoy.
Track number five. So this track that you've picked is from the game Undertale, and this yes. is a game I've had it sitting in, in my Steam library for a while now. But I've literally I've picked it up for five minutes to play it, and I didn't like it. But I think not because the game was bad. I think I just was not in the right mood for it at all. As I, I think I was put off by like the simplistic design of it all. But I think that's also mm-hmm. part of its charm. So I want to go back into it and give it a proper go because yeah i definitely think you should yeah yeah yeah. um it's kind of like deceptively simple looking like the character art and the backgrounds and that kind of thing um they're definitely pretty but the real like artistic goodness so to speak uh comes in the narrative uh the music and oddly enough in the the fighting sequences when the graphics are suddenly well I don't say graphics but like the quality of the pixel art style is just like upped by a thousand. Uh, I think it's almost intentional that he made the main character look kind of dinky but then all the rest of the characters look amazing. I don't know. Oh, Nobody man. quite knows what this man is doing. <laughs> so this track uh I love it. Uh it is called Asgore. Um so Undertale music just kind of blows me away. Uh, not only is this track musically complicated, so to speak, it's got a lot of layers, it's got a lot of depth going on, it's very smart. Um, but Undertale Music does this thing where it carries a few key melodic motifs throughout a lot of the songs, like a certain string of notes, a certain melody line. Um, it's clever in a way where one of these lines might represent, say, like a town or an area or a character. Uh, the environment, as you're walking around the town, plays that song. Uh, some of the character themes in that town might play that melody along with their songs. Uh, and then the boss fight will play like a twisted and warped version of that melody. So there's this environmental narrative in the melody of the song, which is really, really cool. Um, so Asgore is a king who's ruled over the underground monsters for a really long time. And, you know, he's hyped up in the dialogue and you never see him. He's this big, bad, scary thing to be feared and never look at him in the eye. Right. Um, However, once it's time to face him, and soft spoilers, no big deal, uh, once it's time to face him, you immediately realize he's like this soft old man. Uh, he's like weathered and exhausted from ruling over a kingdom of monsters uh, in unrest for so long. He needs your soul, the soul of a human, to break the barrier and bring his people back to the surface. So like, he's, he's not going down without a fight. He's going to fight you. Uh, yeah. So in that sense, similar, similarly to Rundus, uh, the melody of the song is minor and simple against like a really intense backtrack um so for the king song all the melodic motifs of all the characters are used and put together in one way or another um and if you're thinking about it too hard like i do it kind of (laughs) sings of the pride and hope for redemption and escape for all the monsters after so many years of being trapped uh it kind of further pushes the idea that undertale goes on that uh even the monsters have their own stories. Yeah, the way you're describing uh, like the, the king, the boss that you have to fight, I almost feel sorry for him. 
Like I have some sort yeah. of empathy for him. Yeah, that, that's that's the whole idea, and you can hear that reflected in the song. It's really really cool. Oh, yeah, but it was, well, Undertale. It was um, it's one of those games that was made by one person, wasn't it? Like the whole thing. <sighs> yeah. Those Which people is... get mad because they're so perfect, and it's just oh, they did the whole thing themselves. Uh, the guy's name is Toby Fox, and uh, I actually I heard an interview with him once. He was never formally trained on music. He was never like trained Whoa. how to play the piano. I know. Oh my god, these people! I swear. He he tells a story of like uh, he wishes he was taught how to play the piano because he has that big midi board at his desk right and after hours of playing he'll have to like rest his hands because they're cramped from bad form um so do you think do you think that because it was all like designed by one person and the music and everything all done by one person do you think that like helps the game stay true to its vision like do you think it makes it more cohesive i would definitely think so uh, being a solo developer, you have the advantage of not having to stay on the same page as the rest of your team, so to speak. Like, it's really easy for uh, ideas to get lost, and two different people have two different ideas of how a thing should look or how it's going to happen. And if you're working by yourself, uh, there's no one you have to work like against to get your image out there. Um, so, yeah, you can have this cohesive storyline told exactly the way that you intended it. But it's really, really hard. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine like, the amount of time that must have taken. <laughs> but then maybe that's why the graphics are a bit more simple. Yeah, yeah. That could definitely be a reason. Cool. Well, yeah, well, it's a very good track. Um, so this is Asgore by Toby Fox. Okay, the final track of the show then, and this one I'm really I'm just gonna let you sort of take this one because I have not played I've not played this game. I've played others in the franchise, but not this specific one and from that era. So I I can't really speak okay. about that one in particular. So I'm I'm just gonna let you take it. Okay, cool. Uh, so this track 
is from my personal favorite Zelda game, uh, Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask. It uh, came out on the N64 in, I think it was like 99 or something like that. Um, another example of me taking games from my brother, uh, he played Ocarina of Time. He loved it. That was his jam. Uh, when I got a little bit older, uh, I found his old copy of Majora's Mask sitting around and he didn't play it too much. Uh, he didn't like it as much as, as Ocarina, but I put that thing in and I played the crap out of it. Um, I remember like, uh, we always went to church early in the morning on Sundays and I remember like, just sitting in church, like wanting to get back and playing it. And then I go back home <laughs> and play it all day on Sunday. Um, so Majora's Mask was kind of my game. Ocarina of Time was kind of my brother's game. Um, so we've done a whole lot of dramatic songs so far. I wanted to end off on something a little bit more lighthearted. Uh, this track is called Zora Hall, Zora, Z-O-R-A. Um, for any fan of Zelda, they know that the Zora are a race of fish creatures. Um, they're, they're really, really cool. They have like this humanoid shape, but they got fish heads and that kind of thing. They're, they're kind of funny looking. Um, <laughs> but so about the track, right? I think it's super important for game music composers to like complement the setting of a themed environment with worldly cultural influences, right? Um, yeah. So uh, the desert track in Ocarina of Time uh, has like this uh, Spanish guitar style thing, right? Um, so Zora Hall has a lot more of this Latin funky jazz vibe. Um, it's, it's, it's very third... chilled out, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it really, really is. And that's and that's part of why I, I, I like it so much. I'm always uh, lean towards the chill, so like, kind of like relaxing side of music. Yeah. Um, so Zora Hall is the third environment that you visit. Uh, it's this awesome like coral reef turned into like this hotel place inside of an underwater cave. It's kind of like, if you can imagine, it's a large dome uh, with walls lined with rooms and shops and hallways. Um you get a mask in the game that allows you to turn into a Zora, uh, and it gives you like this really uh, expanded swimming ability. So there's water channels to swim in, and there's actually a stage in the middle of the hall where a band is getting ready to play. There's all there's all kinds of characters. Mm -hmm. Just a very, it's like a happy place in an otherwise melancholy kind of game, right? I've always yeah. loved Majora's Mask, and a lot of people will say the same thing. Its story is kind of not really dark but kind of um, humbling i suppose um it's it's kind of like that same feeling of how you can be scared of ghosts but still love to hear ghost stories right um, yeah i can relate to that yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah absolutely um so i love as i said the latin vibe of the song um i like to think that even if you haven't played the game or don't know anything about the area if i hadn't said anything you can still get a pretty good picture of what this place looks like and if a track can achieve that it's 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 golden yeah so like for me i haven't played the game um and i still yeah i got that kind of I don't know if it'd be right, but I got that almost home. I got the hotel kind of vibe. I'd say it's like hey, you're chilling, yeah. chilling out in a lounge, waiting for something to happen. Everything's just kind of plodding along nicely, but you're good. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, this is uh, Zora Hall from Majora's Mask.
So I want to say a massive thank you to Brennan for joining me on this episode of ComposerCast. And is there anything you'd like to let listeners know about? Like, where can they reach you? Where can they find out like what you're working on at the moment? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, so hi, everyone. Uh, <laughs> um, I am a college student uh, based in Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I am studying for my bachelor's in game design and development. Uh, you can see the kind of stuff I do on Twitter um, at my name, B-R-A-N-N-A-N, and then underscore V-I-T-E-K, Brandon underscore Vitek. Uh, oftentimes I will post uh, like pictures of the artwork I'm doing or gifts of stuff I'm working on. Um, I'm on the good side of Twitter. I don't talk about politics or anything. Uh, yeah. it's, it, it, it's all game making related content. Um, on Saturdays and then occasionally throughout uh, the weekdays, I will stream as I'm working on games on Twitch. That's just my name, all one word. Be, uh, it's like twitch.tv slash B-R-A-N-N-A-N-V-I-T-E-K. Um, you can find me basically anywhere with my name, all one word. Um, <laughs> I, I, I have some tracks on SoundCloud too with that same kind of thing, but it's nothing I really like you know show out to people it's just kind of where i put my drafts and stuff awesome all right well thank you very much for joining me and i will see you next time folks bye bye bye